Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, November 29th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, Hillary's recount lawyer in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, who is also the hired gun for Soros to fight voter ID in North Carolina, now says that the recount in North Carolina's governor race should be stopped, even though the Democrat there is leading by a razor-thin margin. Then, are Hillary and Michelle Obama already planning for a 2020 run for president? Maybe 2020 will be hindsight. And we look at Tom Price, Trump's choice for health and human services. Fifteen years ago, Price sponsored bills for draconian gun and vaccine measures during a declared emergency. But more recently, he's been a firm opponent of Obamacare, calling for total repeal before any modification. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Well, if you're like me, you woke up this morning to some of Donald Trump's tweets calling for people who burn the flag to be thrown in jail or have their citizenship revoked. Now, <laughs> this sent red flags up the pole for me like Donald Trump. What are you talking about? Citizenship revoked. That's beyond the pale. That is insane. And of course, that's all the networks have been talking about all day. But did Donald Trump actually troll everyone once again? Because, of course, Hillary Clinton was one of the sponsors of this U.S. flag burning bill uh, back in 2005. So this is the Flag Protection Act of 2005. She co-sponsored this bill saying people who uh, burn the flag either get a year in jail or a $100,000 fine. And once people started tweeting at the media that, hey, you know, Hillary Clinton actually thought the same type of consequences should face those burning a flag, then of course they sort of fell silent about that. Trump was also late night trolling CNN, saying the network did a terrible job during the campaign. They were totally in the can for Hillary Clinton and they'll never learn their lesson. Case in point, they're still attacking Alex Jones. Donald Trump and Alex Jones, the conservative conspiracy theorist and operator of the website InfoWars. He's not dealing in fact or fact that, or evidence that anyone has been provided, that he's spreading inaccurate information. To say that there's no evidence of any voter fraud mm -hmm. in the United it's States of America. widespread voter fraud, widespread serious voter well, you fraud, just said, millions you of people it's voting illegally. This is the, a candidate who has lied more in presidential candidate history than any other candidate we have ever seen. But again, is Donald Trump really just trolling all of us? I mean, we're looking at some of his potential uh, picks to fill out key positions it, within his administration. Uh, today, he met with Goldman Sachs President Gary Cohn. So <laughs> this is someone who he's considering for a key position. And, you know, of course, he ran his campaign decrying the influence of big banks and international financial institutions. He has leaned heavily on Wall Street executives, though, as he's preparing to take office. Now, Cohn is a registered Democrat. He's been a prolific political donor contributing more than 275,000 to Democrats, including Obama and Hillary Clinton. Um, so, you know, he actually donated to uh, Marco Rubio's campaign for the Republican presidential nomination, but nothing for Trump. So very interesting there. Uh, of course, we've now seen him talking about uh, General David Petraeus. Uh, after meeting with him, he said he was very impressed well, someone who's not impressed, of course, myself, David Knight. Senator Rand Paul has joined the chorus of concerned Americans saying hiring Petraeus would be like hiring Hillary Clinton. He says it would be highly hypocritical for Trump to appoint someone to his administration who mishandled classified information after he advocated criminally charging Hillary Clinton for the exact same reason. And of course, a lot of people pointed that out where uh, Petraeus was he was in trouble for doing the exact same thing, whereas they were trying to get Hillary Clinton off, saying, you know, no, nothing to see here. What Rand Paul stressed is that he wants somebody who understands the Iraq war was a mistake, the nation building has been a mistake, and that regime change has been a mistake. These are things that Donald Trump expressed uh, during, you know, the campaigning, and he says he completely agrees with it. He wants to hold uh, Donald Trump to that. That's why he supported him. And, of course, let's not forget, uh, Petraeus was also 
very big on uh, gun control regulation. So here we have some high-level CIA head, uh, former military there, and saying that only the standing army, the standing military, not the, the U.S. citizens here, kind of rewriting the whole Second Amendment. So that's very troubling in that. And of course, um, here troubling, a lot of people are happy with his pick for the Health and Human Services uh, this is Georgia Rep Tom Price. They say he is going to put the target day one. He's going to knock out Obamacare. That's going to be his job day one. Um, this is sending a strong signal that Trump is going to uphold his pledge to repeal and replace Obamacare. Um, a lot of uh, pro-life people are very happy with this choice as well. Price is an orthopedic surgeon, and he did more than vote dozens of times with his colleagues to repeal the Affordable Care Act. He, he also put forth a detailed blueprint of what would come next, a health care system that relies more on market forces than government mandates. And of course, this is something that Donald Trump has said as well that would actually help fix Obamacare. But a big red flag here with Price is that he also put forth legislation mandating um, for mandatory vaccinations, mandatory quarantine and mandatory gun control in emergency situations. So that is very troubling there. But again, here with this repealing Obamacare and, and certain things, it's almost like they're going to work at repealing the globalist agenda initiatives first and then work on the other stuff later. So I say here we should probably give Donald Trump a chance to do what he said he's going to do. But of course, we all need to speak very vocally, very loudly when we see some trouble there on the horizon because you know now that he's in the swamp he's gonna have the goblins biting at his ankles um he, kind of some more evidence of this pushing back against the global corporate monopoly that we're seeing he added an antitrust expert to the justice uh, department's transition team so the incoming administration could be less friendly to mega mergers this is republican antitrust veteran um, David Higby, he's a partner at the law firm Hunton and Williams LLP. He worked for George W. Bush's administration. But their, lawyers are saying that this signals a more hands-off approach to antitrust enforcement compared to what Obama uh, was used to. So, you know, you can't control corporations with government regulations or you can't control the monopoly because companies like Amazon or Google, Jeff Bezos, whatever, they use the government to get even bigger. So the way that you're able to break up these monopolies is by allowing for competition, not by trying to get the government in there to regulate everything, as we see that has totally failed in the past. So, you know, that's a good sign. But just when you thought it was safe to forget about Hillary Clinton, you know, it's been three weeks, everyone's thinking, let's just move on. It's time to, you know, let Trump do his job. Well, now people are saying that Hillary Clinton could be planning yet another run for president in 2020. I don't believe it. I don't think she's going to make it. Uh, but this is according to the National Journal columnist Ron Fournier. He says Hillary's involvement in Jill Stein's widely derided recount is all part of the agenda. Um, it's just part of her plans to keep her options open for 2020, as well as the strategy of the endless series of random viral selfies of Clinton out with voters. She just wants to portray herself as a regular person, attempting to eschew the reality that she's completely out of touch. I don't think she, she's damaged goods. She's going to be too old. And it's interesting because they're already pushing Michelle Obama for 2020. So it'll be interesting if she did. Let's just say she did roll out of the crypt and try to run in 2020. It'd be interesting to see those two going at it like they did in 2008. Of course, going back to Jill Stein. Even Democrats now are just blasting her efforts, this recount effort. They're saying it's a total scam. And indeed it is. She's raised a lot of money, but that money isn't even guaranteed to go to the recount. It's going to be going to prop up uh, the Green Party. So it's totally scam. The Obama administration's come out saying that the election results accurately reflect the will of the American people. Clinton's campaign uh, attorney has actually said they haven't uncovered any actionable evidence of hacking or outside attempts to alter the voting technology. So this will be said. There's no proof. Why is she doing this? It's a total failed operation. But now she's raised even more than the two million dollars necessary. Six million plus at this point. And guess what? It's going to go to help the Green Party in the future. And here's a little bit of a hypocrisy, which I think is like a criteria of the alt left. Hillary's lawyer who 
just two days ago confirmed that he would be participating in Jill Stein's recounts in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Uh, Mark Elias is now publicly calling on North Carolina Republican gubernatorial candidate Pat McCrory to halt his recount efforts because he's in, has an insurmountable 9,000 vote margin, which of course is less than half of what he's you know saying could be that gap that could really clinch the deal to show that there was some vote fraud going on there with Hillary and uh, Trump. I mean, total hypocrisy. Just move move aside. Um, something that <laughs> was really kind of outraging people, of course, yesterday we saw uh, another attack there at Ohio State University, and immediately people were coming out saying, oh, that poor little jihadist, that poor guy, everyone, let's just feel sorry for him. Well, here's this um, filmmaker, independent filmmaker, Tariq Nasheed, a self-described anti-racism strategist. Well, he come out, comes out saying, hmm, it's very interesting that they're using the term hero to describe the white police officer who shot and killed a black suspect. Racist. Ugh, totally crazy. This guy blocked me on Twitter because I told him that the Grinch wants his eyebrows back because all he does is use racist rhetoric to get his point across. Uh, he's a total joke. Um, John Kasich actually received his own tidal wave of Twitter hate for ushering out his condolences for uh, those that were hurt in this attack yesterday. And people are blaming him, saying, you're the one that opened the floodgate, opened Ohio's borders to allow in all the international, international refugees. So people are saying that's totally your fault. And here, Trump was right about Somali migrants. Now, this was just three weeks ago. Trump actually cautioned that Somali migrants in states such as Minnesota were refusing to integrate and that a portion of them posed a terror threat. And of course, you know, people were just all in an uproar about that. But under President Obama, 43,000 Somali refugees have been settled in the U.S. with no adequate way to check their backgrounds as they enter the country. And indeed, uh, the Republican-led Congress is going to be overseeing a large-scale importation of Somali migrants. Since 2001, the U.S. has permanently resettled nearly 100,000 migrants from Somalia. This is a nation where female genital mutilation for women and girls is about 98%. Uh, homosexuality can be punishable by death. And in a single year, Congress is funding visas for nearly 300,000 Muslim Im immigrants from Somalia. So this is more than, than double the size of the entire population of Dayton, Ohio. 18-year-old Somali refugee Abdul Razak Ali Artan, who obtained a green card to enter the United States in 2014, injured 11 students on the Ohio State University campus yesterday, first striking them with a car and then exiting the car to attack the students with a butcher knife. WorldNet Daily reports campus police chief Craig Stone said, our officer was on the scene in less than a minute and he ended the situation in less than a minute. He engaged the suspect and he eliminated the threat. The suspect is DOA. Artan had been quoted in the campus newspaper, The Lantern, several months ago, complaining about the school's lack of Islamic prayer rooms. He blamed the negative view Americans have of Muslims on Islamophobia planted in their minds by the US media, not by the numerous terror attacks or sexual assaults. And the delusional blame game continues to mushroom. Tariq Nasheed, an extreme left documentary filmmaker, bemoaned, so white officer Alan Haruko, who shot and killed the black Somali stabbing suspect in Ohio, is being paraded as a hero? That's interesting. Anti-Second Amendment Senator Tim Kaine tweeted, deeply saddened by the senseless act of gun violence at Ohio State this morning, praying for the injured and the the entire Buckeye community. Of course, no gun was used. Paul Joseph Watson pointed out that a woman named Kay tweeted, poor kid goes through hell as a child in Somalia, comes to America, probably been bullied by racists in white Ohio. Now he's dead. Thanks, Trump. And even the New World Order chimed in as Anna de Rothschild tweeted, thoughts and prayers are with the victims in Ohio. America must wake up and abolish your second amendment. It is 100% the problem. Trump is blind.
Meanwhile, back here in reality that exists 24-7 outside of the Twitter universe, people in Columbus, Ohio now have more reason to be looking over their shoulder. As recent as February of 2016, Mohammed Berry, a Muslim immigrant from Guinea, charged into the Nazareth restaurant in Delhi in Columbus, Ohio and attacked the patrons with a machete in what was described as a bloodbath. Berry was shot dead. CNSNews.com reports 98,790 99 Somali refugees have settled in the United States since 9-11. More than 99% of those refugees are Muslim, reflecting the religious makeup of Somalia's population, which is almost entirely Muslim, predominantly Sunni. The largest number of Somali refugees arriving in the country since 9-11 have been settled in Minnesota, almost 16,000, Ohio, more than 7,500, and sizable communities also in Texas, New York, and Arizona. America chose Trump for a reason. Paul Joseph Watson writes, Just three weeks ago, Trump cautioned that Somali migrants in states such as Minnesota were refusing to integrate and that a portion of them posed a terror threat. Some of them are joining ISIS and spreading their extremist views all over our country and all over the world said Trump. Of course, no one wants to call it a terror attack, but Barry and Artan were just following orders from terrorists. Business Insider reports, Michael Smith, the founder of security from Cronus Advisory, who has advised Congress on terror-related issues, pointed out on Twitter that an ISIS video released days before the OSU attack showed a French ISIS member demonstrating how to kill people using knives. The ISIS member also called for attacks in the West, and in the past two months, English-language ISIS propaganda magazines have called for vehicle and knife attacks. Sorry, Anna de Rothschild and Senator Tim Kaine. Thanks to people like you and your globalist policies, this is precisely why Americans need their Second Amendment rights. John Bound for Infowars.com. Everybody's been watching Donald Trump's picks, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, he has a lot of people on his list and positions that he's not filled yet at the top. And one of those I want to talk about tonight is Treasury Secretary. Because we've got a possibility here of somebody that he might appoint that would end the Fed. This guy is on the same page as Ron Paul, and Donald Trump met with him yesterday. He is on the same page as Ron Paul, and yet as a former banker of a regional bank, uh, BB&T, he understands the details of the banking industry and can speak to those details. He's also been uh, with the Cato Institute. And I'm going to read you uh, some of the things that he wrote. But who are the people that are on the short list for Donald Trump's Treasury Secretary? Of course, there's Steve Mnuchin, who is a Goldman Sachs banker, 17 years. He was with Goldman Sachs. He was also Trump's campaign chair since May. So there's a close personal relationship there. Most people believe that because of that, he is a front runner. Yet, uh, Donald Trump is still meeting with other people. We have House Financial Services Chairman Jeb Henserling, who is going to meet with Trump on Thursday. Uh, but yesterday he met with John Allison, as I pointed out, former CEO of BB&T. Now, Ron Paul has said, and rightly so, that to really make America great again, we need to end the Fed. This guy could be the man who ends the Fed. Business Insider said Trump is meeting with an ex-banker uh, CEO who wants to abolish the Federal Reserve and return to the gold standard. They said that Trump's uh, been on the campaign trail. He questioned the future of the Financial Reserve's political independence. But Allison also takes that rhetoric a step further. He said, I would get rid of the Federal Reserve because of the volatility in the economy is primarily caused by the Fed. When the Fed is radically changing the money supply, distorting interest rates, over-regulating the financial sector, it makes rational economic calculation difficult. Markets do form bubbles, but the Fed makes them worse. Now, I tell you this because... Donald Trump has not made this pick yet, just as he's not made the Secretary of State pick. And we look at people like Mitt Romney, people like David Petraeus. I think we need to speak out. Now is not the time to go to sleep. Now is the time to pay careful attention to the people that are on the list that uh, Donald Trump is interviewing. We need to help him stay outside of Washington and away from influences that are going to really subvert his presidency in the same way we saw Ronald Reagan's presidency get subverted. So I think we need to support the good people. I think we need to oppose the bad people as we see this developing. And let me read you some of the things that John Allison wrote at the Cato Institute, because he really does understand the situation. He's a government skeptic. He says this, one observation in my 40-year career at BB&T, 
I don't know it a single time when federal regulators, primarily FDIC, but actually identified a significant bank failure in advance. Regulators are always the last ones to the party after everybody in the market, the other bankers, know something's going on. Thus, in that context, regulators have a 100% failure rate. Indeed, in my experience, whenever they get involved with a bank that's struggling, they always make it worse because they don't know how to run a bank. See, that's the key thing. He also points out the self-interest of the bureaucracy. He says they like to talk about the public good, but really what they're pursuing is the regulatory good. He says sometimes the public good and the regulatory good may align, but they don't manage for the public good. They consistently manage for the regulatory good. He points out that uh, the people who get appointed to these positions are people who are politically connected. Hopefully that will change. Maybe Donald Trump will reach out to somebody who is not part of the political establishment like John Allison, who understands this. Then he goes on to characterize regulations under Bush, Clinton, and Obama, and he is spot on. Listen to this. He said President Bill Clinton's big issue was fair lending. The regulators paid almost no attention to safety or to soundness. And what happened? We got the massive consolidation of banks. We got too big to fail. We got the repeal of Glass-Steagall, which allowed them to do things that were not sound. So he understands that. Then he says under President George W. Bush, the focus was almost exclusively on the Patriot Act. One of the great myths is that banks were deregulated under Bush, yet three major new laws were passed under his administration. The Privacy Act, the Sardanes-Oxley, and the Patriot Act. A massive increase in regulations in the Bush era, the most in the current administration. And he goes on to say that under President Obama, we have a truly unique phenomenon, an administration that likes all regulations. And so we could go on with this, but we don't have the time. Let me just finish up with what he has to say about Dodd-Frank. He said under new consumer compliance provisions of Dodd-Frank, the qualified lending standards are very loose. In fact, standards are below subprime, which makes progressives happy. However, the paperwork is extraordinarily complex. That's why small banks are going out of business. He says it's ironic that the Fed is printing money willy-nilly, then having regulators making it harder for banks to make loans to small businesses and going out of business themselves. So... Whether or not Donald Trump picks John Allison, he is a man to listen to, and we should consider that. For InfoWars.com, I'm David Knight. This is Owen Troyer for InfoWars.com. We're here at the University of Texas in Austin, and we're going to find out what students here think about the late communist dictator, Fidel Castro. I kind of didn't even know he was still alive until, like, he died. But, I mean, I knew who he was, and I know a lot of people are happy about his death, which, and then there's some people that are sad, so. Um, I just hope the best for Cuba right now. I know they had, he caused a lot of, uh, a lot of uproar in the past, so I guess it signifies like a change, a good change. Honestly, I think he was a bad dictator, but he's dead. I think it's funny that like America spent millions trying to kill him and then he just like dies off on his own. I don't think he was a very good leader. I am not upset that he's dead at all. And I hope that somebody else takes over his ruling and does way better than he did. Um, he was a dictator and should not be romanticized for recently dying. It is upsetting that he died, of course, but... I'm Taiwanese, so I do have a kind of negative image of communism in general, but man's a man. He died, left a legacy, but it's really up to the Cubans to decide who, what opinion they should hold. <laughs> Other than the irony of him dying on Black Friday, I don't really have too many uh, opinions. Uh, well, as a South American, I'm from Colombia. Um, he always had the fame of... Um, of being a dictator and uh, being um, aggressive and having his people uh, submerged into a dictatorship. He provided their free education in Cuba. Uh, it's the country that has graduated the most doctors uh, per capita. Oh, I don't have any good opinions on that one, my bad. Well, based off of like how Cubans feel about it, and how he was very oppressive and everything. Um, I guess I would side on their um, their opinions because they were the ones that were oppressed. And I said it's, it's probably a good thing that he passed away. I don't know how he is as a person historically. Did both good and bad things. Bad mostly for U.S. Good for mostly Cuba for the most part. Uh, I know he did a lot of bad stuff for the Cuban people and. Uh, uh, but he increased, I know he increased the amount of uh, doctors in the country dramatically. I mean, he did egregious things and death is sad, but hopefully there's a better tomorrow. Um, 
I guess I'm not too supportive of him just because I have a lot of friends that like immigrated here from Cuba and just from talking to them and like their family history. I don't think that he's necessarily like, the best person. Well, I think he was an oppressive dictator of an authoritarian regime, a communist regime that resisted the uh, the influence of the United States in a lot of ways and yeah, glad he's dead. Who would you guys prefer as a leader, Donald Trump or Fidel Castro? Donald Trump? Yeah, that, that's probably Donald Trump. Gotta go with Donald there too. Uh, no comment. Come on. No, I really don't know. So you think Trump is as bad as Castro? Um, I wouldn't say as bad, but to pick between those two, it's I would need more research. I mean, I would still go with Trump because I don't know, even though Trump's personality is a little frightening, I think that, like, his past is not related to communism, and that's yeah. a little bit, you know, more <laughs> um, assuring. I'm, like, Republican, so I would say not communism. Anything besides Donald Trump, honestly, at this so point. So Castro over Trump? I guess. Donald Trump or Fidel Castro? Uh, probably Trump. What about you? Probably Trump. <laughs> uh, Trump. You pick Trump? Yep. Probably Donald Trump. Maybe Donald Trump. I feel like he has like a different way to like handle things and look at things and maybe his way is like the way to do it. So I know Fidel Castro is not. Donald Trump or Fidel Castro? <laughs> Neither. <laughs> Well, I feel like Castro has a lot of conflicts with the general, like, government of America, right? That just, that wouldn't work. So, folks, we just heard from the students here at the University of Texas. Now, most did not have an in-depth understanding of Fidel Castro. Some didn't know much about him at all. But most of the people here understood on the surface that he was a communist dictator and oppressive, though some said that the good outweighed the bad. Others said that the bad outweighed the good. But you saw the amazing reaction we got from people when they had the choice between Trump and Castro. Some were so paralyzed they couldn't even make that choice. When we threw them a third option, Trump, Castro, or death, you saw the reaction to that. It was still hard for them to choose between Donald Trump, Fidel Castro, or death. It must be tough here at the University of Texas. Democrats headed into the election on Tuesday, November 8th. They woke up to a huge shock. They lost a lot of their seats. We're going to be talking about this. I'm Margaret Hall reporting for Infowars.com. I'm joined in studio by our, by our nightly news director, Rob Dew. And the shock, they're wiping the smirk off their faces, number one, Rob. But number two... I'm not wiping mine He's up. not. He knew the whole time. Number two, they're scrambling to find a new leader in the wake of what was a catastrophe for them. You know, I pulled this article, and you can't believe the rhetoric just before Trump won. One of them says Trump's incendiary presidential campaign would be a curse on vulnerable Republicans. Of course, that didn't happen. And now they're all scrambling because they're the vulnerable ones and they're about to prop up this ridiculous leader yet again, right. uh, 14 years straight. I, I don't know what they're thinking. You'd think that they would get rid of her. Nancy Pelosi's been in power since 07 as the Speaker <laughs> of the House. And she, the levels of people, her levels of Democrats in the House have gone down. <sighs> they've just gone down. They've gone. Down. They're at their lowest level since 1929. So I really don't know what she's expecting. They'll probably just put her in because the Democrats haven't learned from this election. They're still fighting these. Uh, they're still playing this race game, this gender game. That you know, the whole deck is stacked against anybody um, if, if they're not a, a white male. You and think it's just because she's a woman? I mean, is that the only appeal that she would have if you're a Democrat voting? I think at this she's, point, yeah, because oh, you really, she hasn't said anything very, she said some really stupid statements. We're going to get to a whole compilation of them at the end of this. Rob brought you such a yeah. treat. Um, Nancy Pelosi, Idiocy 101. Uh, you mentioned that she has a contender. Tim Ryan is, right. is his name. He's coming out of Ohio. Little known about this guy. Um, in one article that we pulled from the Washington Post, apparently comes out of the Rust Belt. Here's what he had to say on election night, which is hilarious on the eve of the vote. We're within striking distance. I think a lot of people are going to be surprised tomorrow. We have a lot of support regarding Hillary Clinton's victory. So he's not a bright guy, clearly. Um, but it looks like he couldn't even bring people to a rally that had LeBron James at it in Cleveland. Serious? I, there was like 300 people there. But he's from Ohio, which is the melting pot. And uh, supposedly in his area, uh, he's well liked, despite Trump having taken Ohio. He cites. Um, how disliked in this article Trump actually is and was in Ohio, which makes no sense at all. But it looks like he's trying to pull on the fact that he's this middle America 
uh, guy who's mm -hmm. this average Joe. Um, Washington Post has already declared her the victor. She's already declared it herself, by the way. I'm just quoting her. And uh, she's got some arrogance about her, frankly. I mean, oh, I guess it's yeah. hers. Hey, let Let's me get, get into this. Back, <laughs> back in July, she made, or maybe it was in June. It was June in 2016. Uh, she made a shoe trip. She went to go shop at a shoe store. And here's what Paul Smith was actually a witness to this. Here's what he wrote. A large, perfectly polished and gleaming black SUV is attempting a left turn from Hunt onto southbound Maine. Not easy. Suddenly, blue and red lights are flashing from the windshield uh, of the SUV. And I, I said to my friends, I've never seen any. That's not a regular vehicle. I think that's illegal. That's dangerous. He points out that a police car ha happens to be going northbound, pulls into the center lane, who's, and the, the policeman starts shaking his arms and hollering at the driver of the SUV, who pays no attention to him, lest this lady out and she walks in to the shoe store which is called uh, Foot Candy, I believe. Yeah, Foot Candy. All right. Then he t says goodbye to his friends. He's walking up to the shoe store. As I approach Foot Candy, Nancy Pelosi comes out with shopping bags and a man assists her into the SUV. The SUV flashing lights burst back on and they burst back into southbound traffic. He goes, wow, <laughs> privilege, power, who's SUV? Taxpayers? He questioned, say it ain't so Nancy. So this guy's probably a Democrat too. Probably one of these you know, do-gooder Democrats who thinks that you know, because they have the right feelings right. that everything's okay. But here she is, just one of the, you know, this is her, how she, she acts with emergency. her power. Yeah. Right. She's, she's without, and not only that, but the woman never takes responsibility for anything that she says or does at all. Um, I can understand speeding to get shoes. This that I brought you, I cannot understand. Um, and I didn't know this prior to, to looking at this, but apparently members of Congress, they actually have the ability to um, commit insider trading. Which oh yeah, it's I legal, this, right? Right. We would be re we would be fined, jailed, our homes would be gone. Apparently, uh, 60 Minutes did an expose on her about how she bought these stocks and these initial IPOs. She made major money uh, from from class of person, you know, information that she had access to that you and I. It would be a crime if we capitalized on it. Not illegal for her to do it, but it really it lets you know about the character of the woman. She's. She's using the extent of her, her, you know, whatever she has in that office to, to the highest possible degree to benefit herself. I think if it's you're a Democratic that. woman, you could do whatever you want in this country. You could probably kill people with a machete, drive over them with a car. See, that guy was, was <laughs> a Somali man. He wasn't allowed to do that. But office. if Nancy Pelosi ran down a bunch of people in Ohio State and started hacking them with a machete, it would probably be okay. They'd probably say, well, she's a woman. Um, you know, and she's a Democrat, so obviously she had our best intentions in heart. Right. Well, you can't question uh, the motivation of Nancy Pelosi. That's that's for sure. Or you know, the, the woman is is untouchable as far as I'm concerned. 14 years in power, and what has she done exactly other than use her position to buy expensive shoes and make a crap ton of money uh, based on information? Well, now, and, and the Clintons did the same thing. If you true. when they came out of the presidency, we were dead broke. <laughs> and then she becomes a senator. They start the Clinton Foundation, and they have hundreds of millions of dollars now. They're worth like over a hundred million dollars. Their daughter has a, a multi-million dollar apartment in right, New York. Right. Like who can afford this stuff on the salary of a senator from New York? Not, no, no, you can't really do that unless you're siphoning off that money from your multi-billion dollar Clinton Foundation. You know, you, you want to believe that people are magnanimous, they have good hearts, but then you look at what they're doing, you're like, holy mother, they are using their positions of power and influence. Um, to line their own pockets. And she she's a total Clinton crony as far as I'm concerned. Now, moving right along the DNC, we've talked about how the Democratic Party as a whole in Congress, they're scrambling to find a head now that Trump has um, figuratively cut it off. The DNC, the same thing. Alex covered this time and again. I know you have as well. Um, how corrupt they are. We've talked about WikiLeaks, you know, what, what they're actually doing, uh, what they did to Bernie Sanders, frankly. And uh, since what w they did in the debates, they don't play they, by the rules. They don't Donna play Brazil. by the rules. Exactly. Precisely. Uh, they're scrambling to find a head now that theirs has been severed. Of course, Brazil disgracefully removed, um, also fired from CNN. And uh, Keith Ellison is who they're throwing up as the contender, the main contender, to head the DNC. Just a little bit about him. Of course, he's a Muslim. Uh, he's in Congress. And uh, he's made some pretty inflammatory, radical statements. He loves Fidel Castro. He loves Fidel. Yeah. Not, uh, he called Fidel Ca Get this, Rob. So uh, this is what he had to say about uh, Castro's death and his passing. Did he use dictatorial, t dictate, dictatorial tactics? Yes, probably he did. But did he also stand up for peace and freedom in Africa? Absolutely. When was that? Am I when he sent something? a bunch of Cubans to actually run uh, Desk Squad? Right.
right. And, okay. Like, and try a coup in Africa. What is he talking about? I mean, I, in fact, I think Che went to Africa to, uh, it, it, to foment that rebellion. You know, people that that really tells you where his politics lie. Is he a communist? That would be my next question. You know, what's what's up with Keith Ellison? He actually advocated for a separate state for black people in America at one point. He's a radical. The Democratic Party is not the party of the people anymore. They were a creature of Wall Street for the last 20 years. So right. it's, it's, it's a, a deserving death at this point that is happening slowly before our eyes. Maybe, uh, you know, people like, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren can kind of keep it revival. But I think it's going to go more socialist than it is more centrist. But without further ado now, let's go to those amazing Nancy Pelosi quotes, which tells you why. Yeah, it makes me wonder why, how somebody like this could still be in elected office. But we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. You increase taxes, that also hurts growth. Well, it's about timing. It's about timing, and it's about timing as to when you make cuts as well. Uh, we, but you, but you the, the fiscal cliff, you raised taxes, $650 billion right away. Yeah, and that was a very good thing to do on people making uh, over uh, the high end uh, in our um, um, population. I don't think he's ever done anything for political reasons. <laughs> <laughs> the Affordable Care Act is bringing the cost of, of health care in our country down in both the public and private sector, and that is what is largely responsible for the deficit coming down. And everybody will have lower rates, more, uh, better quality care, and better access. Uh, I don't remember saying that every, everybody in the country would have a lower premium. And it is one year this week since the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. So we have a lot to celebrate, and that's why we're proud to stand before the flags uh, to celebrate life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We'll also uh, be observing uh, health independence. This week uh, uh, this marks one year since the Supreme Court upheld the Affordable Care Act. Uh, it captures the spirit of our founders, uh, of the spirit they wrote in the Declaration of Independence. Life liberty and the pursuit. Well, I'm Margaret Hill reporting for Infowars.com. We covered this story, Joe Biggs and I, yesterday about this Somalian refugee who plowed into a group of students, took out a butcher knife, hacking into nine of them, ultimately shot and killed by police. And we're, we're beginning to see the media spin, frankly, about this young man, who he is, the refugee crisis as a whole. It's really starting to annoy me. And I know you brought some really interesting information, especially on social media, regarding who this attacker was and how people are feeling about it. Does it annoy you at all to see the media spin? on this already so quickly what i can't stand is when an attack comes out it's automatically they're they're ready to say white guy right white guy with a gun lone wolf is yeah. how they're painting this in particular he's yeah. not a part it's a lone wolf i mean he has nothing to do with isis whatsoever even right. though isis particularly called out for an attack like this on american soil and isis has now come out today and claimed that this guy was part of their brotherhood mm -hmm. and that this was an attack that they hold dear and he represents ISIS and was one of their soldiers for Allah. Mm -hmm. You know, what I can't stand is is the left is always ready to just jump immediately on gun control. Now look at this. Senator uh, Tim Kaine, deeply saddened by the senseless act of gun violence at Ohio State this morning, praying for the injured and the entire Buckeye community. Hello, McFly. <laughs> it was a car and a butcher's knife. <laughs> hey, how about we wait till the facts come out before you right. jump on here with your commie love and chubby fingers and start tweeting away right. and sound like an unprofessional douchebag. Well, people don't First, even know who Tim Kaine is anymore. <laughs> the election's over. They're like, who is so, so I told the guy, I said, sorry, a hero with a gun killed your terrorist buddy, Sharia Tim Kaine. When real heroes kill terrorists, Tim calls it senseless gun violence. Right. So that's me trolling him. Oh, nice. Here's the lady from Moms Demand Action, Shannon Watts. Our nations protect their students. America gives dangerous people guns and asks students to defend themselves. Well, you don't allow your students to have guns. Right. Second of all, a gun wasn't used in the attack. So maybe just chill out on the tweets for a minute until we get all the facts. Okay, moms demand action. <laughs> maybe you should pull out a dildo and start another rally hey, for that. You know, there, there is, a, there it is, right there. there. <laughs> hey, they're the they're the dildo uh, 
protesters. They love doing this. Our, Here's our another one. That it's a family show. That's right. right. Anyway, but you're you're absolutely right. I mean, they're they're they need to get the facts straight. That's the bottom line here. They need to get the facts straight. Can't wait for all the politicians who refuse to adjust gun laws and send their thoughts and prayers to Ohio State. Well, let's first think about what we're tweeting and get the facts first. And I mean, it, it's just ridiculous. They're so quick to jump on this and blame white people, blame guns. But as soon as it came out that this guy was of Somali descent, then all of a sudden you saw on Twitter, the trend went all the way down to 10. Right, they didn't, precisely. It, 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 they, they don't want to sit here and give that any any light whatsoever because right. it's hard to talk about this. Because at the end of the day, we should feel guilty because of our white privilege. We're the right. ones that caused this, we our this, mean tweets. We saw this with Omar Mateen and uh, the 49 people who died in that Pulse nightclub shooting. We saw this with, uh, I think their last name is the Farouks, if I'm not mistaken, in San Bernardino. And that, you know, that mass death. We see this apology stance happening every single time where the facts are totally sanitized from an article. And you mentioned uh, social media. This um, young man, Abdul um, Artin, actually posted on Facebook expressing anger about the treatment of Muslims around the world. Um, he, you know, this message was discovered by law enforcement um, investigators looking into his social media page. So he was, he was talking about how mistreated Muslims are around the world, and then his response to that is to go and try to kill nine. Oh yeah, this one, he goes, poor kid goes through hell as a child in Somalia, comes to America, probably have been bullied by racists in white Ohio. Now he's dead. Hashtag thanks Trump. Right. <laughs> so yeah, it's not Islam funny. can attack people. Trump supporter. People attack people, and that guy was obviously not right in his mind. And I went, yet yeah, you'll be the first to jump on the gun control bandwagon, right? Won't you? It's insanity, not uh, radical Islam. Look, th it's there is a problem. Anything but radical Islam. It's it Gun violence, it's Trump, it's uh, mental instability, it's anything but radical Islam. Radical Islam is not a problem. Meanwhile, let's look at the list of Islamic terror attacks in 2016, and they stopped doing this test in July because there's quite frankly so many. During this time period, there were 1,274 Islamic attacks in which 11,774 people were killed and 14,303 killed around the world. So that seems kind of like a problem. And their eyes will be like, they just think, well, we'll get those 11,774 people back. It's okay. Don't worry about it. No, this is an issue, and we should call it radical Islam. That is what it is. I feel like it's a breath of fresh air that we're going to have a president who's, quite frankly, not scared to say it for once. Radical Islam. Exactly. Radical Islam. Let's all say it together. You know, the, the radicalization process, and that's largely why uh, you, and I are, you and I are here, because we wanted to talk about how um, there is a radical, radicalization process that happens, and we have to acknowledge it. And for, what, for whatever reason, this young man decided to become radicalized and become an ISIS sympathizer. It's annoying that the media is trying to whitewash it and just call him a lone wolf um, or somebody that had a mental issue, because that's not what was happening. And, and don't you think it's part of the problem when people refuse to even acknowledge that process? I mean, there's a process to this. Um, or no? The, the, there's, the there's, it, a, no, well, there, there, there's a, it's a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a guy named Ami Horowitz who was in Minnesota, Minneapolis. He actually interviewed tons of Somalians. They have a huge population there. And he asked them, what do you think about Sharia law? From children all the way up to old women, we're all like, Sharia law is good. Uh, and then he asked, do you prefer Sharia law over American law? They all said yes. Then he says, would you rather live in Somalia or in the USA? And they all said, these are people who live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They would all rather live in Somalia. This is the problem. They don't want to fit in. Right. They don't want to assimilate don't to our way of life. Don't you have to take a constitutional test to, to acquire citizenship? You have to love and profess the Constitution of the United States, not Sharia law. Isn't that sort of required? Yeah, but if thing? you look at the culture of these people, just like in Iraq and Afghanistan and other Muslim nations, uh, it's okay to lie to non-believers. So for them, when they, when they do that and they lie and they know they're not being truthful, it's okay because at the end of the day, they're trying, it's an ends to a mean or a mean to an ends. So they're doing that so they can get in. And the report we did last week, remember the guy who was uh, one of the uh, terrorists who'd been held at Guantanamo? Right. He said he didn't want another 9-11 attack. He said that's a little too hard. It's easier for them to systematically come in, use these open borders, breed their way in, use the laws against us to better benefit themselves, and then usher in Sharia law and then take over the world. And that, when they find America at its weakest point, that's when they slit the throat. There's an agenda, is, is, is what that confirms. There's an agenda going on. 
and uh, we're very foolish to ignore it. What do you make? Okay, so I just want to shift this to Trump because I know we're running out of time, but we talked about, you know, these instances on the ground and how Trump is being blamed in tweets, ironically. I don't even know what he had to do. What did he have to do with this, Biggs? I mean, what's wrong with people in their, in their conscience? Well, it's 2016, and he's a white person. Right, so he's to blame. He is to blame for, for this. Uh, he is a racist nationalist and he right. wants uh, sovereignty and he wants uh, secure borders right. and he wants to to vet people that are coming into our country when he wants to make sure that these are people who share our values so at the end of the day that makes him a big old racist bigot right chris <laughs> eloquently put by the way eloquently put hey um, man you know, that, that's just how the liberal left is and that it, it's pathetic we live in this day and age where it's come to this point where we can't even be proud americans we can't even be proud to go out and practice our faiths. Meanwhile, this guy was upset because at another university, they didn't have enough prayer rooms for him. So they want to you know, claim that they're the peaceful religion or the religion of peace. Religion Meanwhile, of to peace. prove it, they're willing to go out and kill Murder. people and or attack them, cut them, drive them over with cars, throw them off bridges, uh, kill homosexuals, do all this stuff to prove just how peaceful they are. That's insanity. It is insanity. Omar Hassan, who's the president of this Columbus, Ohio-based Somali Community Association, he said that uh, a member of Artan's family uh, told him that the suspect's mother and siblings had been interviewed by law enforcement and authorities after the incident. In Columbus, just to point this out, they're the second biggest Somali population in the U.S., about 50,000 immigrants from the East African nation residing in this community. So we're talking about a massive population swell in one area. There's a guy named for uh, Farah, who is a Muslim who goes to uh, Ohio State, who is a Somali refugee, says attacks blamed on terrorism have a familiar aftermath on campuses, snide comments, peering eyes. Well, people are kind of scared. Mm -hmm. If you've gone through an attack and a certain type of person did it because of religious beliefs or whatever, that's going to make people a bit apprehensive of other people who look just like that and or act like that. That's not racist. That's just what happens after a traumatic experience. Right. People are automatically going to be a little apprehensive of that. Well, you know what? That's it for tonight's <laughs> segment on this. I've enjoyed our conversation, Thank Mark. You. It's been very informative. Uh, tune in tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, back here at the InfoWars Nightly News.